looking at high and low load resistance exercise. And it was never, it was never intended as, a, as an attack or a defense of a position. It was more just, let's look at some of the other factors around this and why might there be a difference in strength or hypertrophic adaptations from heavy or light load exercise. And one of the key things that I kept coming back to from a practical sense was that um, heavier, heavier load exercise makes it easier to reach true muscular failure. Um, you know, why is that? And, and, you know, the more research we did, looking at dissociating effort and discomfort, the more we, the more we found out, well, when you exercise at a light load or a very light load, 30, 40% of one RM, discomfort is a lot higher and, and likely prevents people from reaching true muscular failure. Um, certainly, it, you know, as a practical example, if I'm lifting a very light load that's sort of 20, 30 repetitions, do I really stop when I reach muscular failure? And actually, can I reach muscular failure? Or do I stop because the physiological sensation of pain and discomfort is so great that psychologically I tell my body I don't want to carry on? I've got, so. I've got several questions around all the stuff you just mentioned. Yeah, mentioned absolutely. I think one of the things which attracted my attention is, is that high load, low load stuff, which seems to be sort of cropping up a little bit or more often in your research now. Yeah. And the first, one of the studies um, you've been involved with recently was on arterial hypertension in postmenopausal um, women. Yeah. And you compared six rep max load to a, a 15 rep max load. Yeah. And um, you found that that, that that was effectively safer, right, to use the, the heavier load. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. Um, I, I, yeah, and I think that more and more research um, is supporting the use of heavy loads. Uh, you know, in that in that um, in that case, that goes against the, the the general thinking that people would say, well, um, you know, you should use a lighter load for safety. If somebody's older, you should use a lighter load if they've got cardiac condition, if they've got joint problems, so on and so forth. And there might well be, you know, obvious examples. Um, or what we think are obvious examples, but actually it's counterintuitive to use a light load because we're incurring either a greater de degree of discomfort or we are prolonging exercise past a certain point that we don't want to do. You know, six repetitions, um, if we avoid the Valsalva maneuver, certainly, is, is likely far safer than performing 20 or 30 repetitions and having a lot longer time under load, putting our cardiac system under you know, that, that greater stress. And so you, that was done with um, post-menopausal post hypertensive women. Do you think that, that would probably apply to all hypertensive I think that I think that, you know, without the research, we can't categorically say one way or the other, and that's the scientists in me defending that. <laughs> um, but I think there's no reason why it shouldn't. Yeah, I think that would be a fair, a fair statement. The discussion on heavier and lighter load is, is one that, you know, you could talk for hours about, or I personally feel like I could talk for hours about it. And, and if we take a bit of a step further back chronologically, I think it was probably 2010 that Brad published a paper looking at heavier and lighter loads, and myself and, and James Steele uh, wrote a letter to the editor um, kind of challenging this idea and sort of saying, actually, you've included, a, you know, you've missed out a few studies, there's replication of data from two studies that were, the data was presented twice. Um, I, I'm kind of just challenging the concept because, w because in my opinion, we're not so committed to the need for heavy loads. For some reason, I think there are people out there that think that that makes me, puts me in one side of the camp, which is the lighter load side of the camp, and that's absolutely not the case. If anything, I'm, I'm finding more and more reason to lift heavier loads. Um, you know, we published the papers around discomfort. I published a paper earlier this year that looks at, kind of challenges some of the ideas around periodization. Um, one of the main reasons being periodization seems to be built on the construct of um, reducing load at different time points and increasing the number of repetitions. Um, but if you go back to, I think it was uh, Gena and Weston looked at blood lactate and cortisol and volume load when you reduce the training load from 55, um, from 75 and from 90 percent and found higher blood lactate levels and higher cortisol accumulation with the lighter loads. So it's somewhat counterintuitive to suggest that lighter load training is easier or, or um, produces a lower degree of physiological stress. Um, and certainly the stuff that we've, we've published looking at, at fatigue and effort and discomfort suggests that there's a higher degree of fatigue from lighter loads 
um, we've got a paper that we're looking at the data right now which suggests that there's a, a more prolonged fatigue from lighter load exercise um, as well. So, you know, the old idea of rehabilitation or old adults or anybody who we should maybe, you know, treat with cotton wool should lift a lighter load might go completely out the window because actually what we're doing is putting through a lot more discomfort, um, making them incur a lot more kind of metabolic stress, blood lactate and cortisol, um, maybe um, impairing their function over successive days because of the lighter load and the prolonged fatigue. Um, and actually that's all somewhat counterintuitive. The other thing around all of this is when we say heavier and lighter loads, what do we actually mean? Uh, and Brad was, was a, you know, key in picking this up. We don't say heavy and light loads, we say heavier or lighter loads. And actually what we should probably be looking at is time under load as a marker. So if you lift 80% of one RM, for, for controlled repetitions that might only equate to 30 to 60 seconds under tension, whereas a light load might be two to three minutes. If we lift a heavy load, but it only equates to 10 to 12 seconds, and you know some of Brad's studies have used exactly this, one to two seconds concentric and eccentric for eight reps, might only equate to 16 seconds or less under tension. Well, I would argue that we probably want a greater stimulus than that, or a longer stimulus than that. Does that then mean multiple sets? So, so, so then the question comes about, does that mean not training to failure and performing multiple sets, so we incur that volume? Um, does it mean that we should reduce the load down a little bit so that we can get to that kind of 30 to 60 second or 60 to 90 second window, which maybe has, you know, has been pitched previously as optimal. I know Wayne Westcott would always say 60 to 90 seconds is optimal. Um, at that point, do we, are, are we bickering over heavier or lighter load? Are we going to debate what 10% means or are we going to say that, well, the load is appropriate for this time duration, for this stimulus? for this exercise, because we also know that different loads, or the same load for different exercises, produces a different number of repetitions. You know, somebody lifting 80% of one RM on a leg extension is different from somebody lifting 80% of one RM on a leg press, or on a chest press, or a lateral raise, and so forth. And we've known that since probably the mid 80s, um, the studies looking at that. So, you know, we start to discuss the more practical implications of this. And I think that, um, again, what we look at is who's our client, what's, our, what's our, our exercise philosophy for time under load, um, and how do we apply, how do we now look at the load we want to use and the rep duration and so forth. You mentioned um, Westcott in this sort of um, time under load of 60 to 90 seconds. Yep. Um, and, and, and in some of your research recently, I think you've been using around a 2 2 um, tempo. Yep. And that would sort of equate if somebody's doing 10 rep max to, let's say, 30 to 40 seconds. Yeah. Uh, 20, yeah, around 30 seconds, let's say, at the low end of the spectrum. Yeah, yeah. Would you say that's enough, or, or potentially enough, as you have evidence that that's enough? <coughs> I, 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 at this stage, I don't know. I think I would need to go back over what studies are out there and, and, and so forth. Um, I would suggest that 30 seconds um, upwards is probably. It's probably, I'd say that's certainly the lower end of the scale. You know, we published this study with Luke Carlson and Discover Strength looking, looking at rep duration. Um, and we're looking at uh, a traditional sort of 2-4 rep duration to a, I mean traditional in the high intensity training, uh, to a 10-10 as a, as a, you know, presentation of super slow to a 30-30-30. And a lot of that doesn't just look at rep duration, but the number of sort of muscle actions performed um, and found no differences between groups but they were all matched to be around the sort of 72 second, it was around 72, 80 second time under load per, per exercise, per set per exercise, obviously doing single sets. And I think that that's probably where we should be shooting for. Um, that to me says that the rep duration was controlled well enough to not incur momentum, um, that the load was appropriate, that the, the load was appropriately high that discomfort didn't impede prevention of reaching muscular failure um, and didn't impede the effort being performed. So I think that it's, um, yeah, I think, I think we're probably looking at around that range for, for our time in the load. And 
The other thing around all of this, of course, that, that very few people are talking about is the load necessary for bone mineral density. So, so most of the studies still are suggesting, you know, 80% of 1RM for bone mineral density. Now we know that there are other ways of, of producing bone mineral density in, in tennis players, it's evident in shoulders and arms and elbows. In runners, it's evident in heel and, um, and hips and things like that. But ag again, we don't want to be missing the trick with that. So using a very light load and going for three minutes for time and for, for time under load might still be adequate for strength and hypertrophic adaptations, but are, is it suboptimal for bone mineral density? And again, if we're doing that with an older adult because they're an older adult, we're really missing a trick because they're the people that probably should be lifting a load that incurs, you know, bone mineral density uh, or the stimulus of, of improved bone density. And would that likely occur around about 70 seconds? Uh, whether it's 70 seconds or whether it's load dependent, I mean, um, the studies that I can recall looking at that have, have, have stated a percentage of 1RM at around 80% or upwards, okay. not necessarily a time under load. So it's again, how, how well can we perform those repetitions with that load to say, you know, or do we need to perform multiple sets with a heavy enough load to reach that, that 70%? That would be interesting to know that, like, bone density, Absolutely. Bone density training. Yeah, and this is the key thing. Uh, myself and a colleague started a review of this to follow up from our 2011 evidence-based paper on strength and 2013 paper on hypertrophy. And to be honest, we, we, we never got through all the data out there, um, partly because bone density studies are, uh, are few, good bone density studies are few and far between because of the length, the intervention, and the time, time scale between measurements. Maybe you could find the sweet spot between muscular adaptation and bone adaptation. That's the key, isn't it? Yeah. Because that's what everybody wants. They don't want to be periodizing their training for bone <laughs> mineral density and strength and hypertrophy and so forth. They want the one workout that they can do.